Brochot about ladies, brochot animtsaot. Thank you so much for coming to our weekly Torah class. And those who are logging on to Zoom, thank you so much for tuning in. We are so happy that every single week you guys tune in and that we have a, a crowd every week. Baruch Hashem, that you, you make it your business to, to join us. Today we have a special guest who I met at an event that we did in Yerushalayim, in Rav Ovadia Yosef Alava Shalom's shul, right? It was around, right before Yom HaKippurim, it was a Seret Yemei Tshuva. Uh, we did a whole program with tefillot and stories and singing. And uh, well, I, really I want to tell you the whole story, but I don't want to take away from your grand moment of telling us the miracle story that happened to you. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to Rachel Leia, uh, who's going to give you a synopsis of what took place there, and then I'll take over. Racholeya, come on up. <laughs> um, so I came to this uh, Sudata meeting because me and my husband were struggling um, for about two years to have a child. And um, I came to the Sudata meeting and everyone you know, gave me a bracha to um, have a child in nine months. This also, Ravani um, also gave me a bracha, and you know it was a process. <laughs> you know we um, actually just had exactly nine months after we just had our first baby on Wednesday. The first baby. Yeah. What a nice nice. One and nine, nine months later, right? Um, yeah. Nine months and a day. Yeah. And a day. Yeah. Wow. 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 You can see that there's definitely miracles in the power of a main also. And yeah. do, do you feel that there was something about that specific event that helped trigger this ness, this miracle? Definitely. Definitely like like it was just a time of like, you know, asking Hashem for help and yeah, you know, the the power like literally forty women saying Amen right. to a bracha. Like I never felt that power of Amen before. I'll tell so. you why I'm telling that because there are many times that I ask the viewers to donate for such events. And mm -hmm. they don't really get you know, the viewers are from all over the world. They don't really get a chance to understand what really goes on there. Mm -hmm. So by you coming down here and letting us, the, the viewers, understand the power of those events and the miracles that are wrought from such events, it pushes them and it prompts them to continue to give. And yes. Be'ezat Hashem, we're going to have another event that we're going to invite you, Be'ezat Hashem. Amen. I know your whole family is going to come, Be'ezat Hashem. So, first of all, I want to say that um, this gorgeous baby that was born needs our tefillot, needs our prayers. Um, she's still in the hospital, correct? In yeah. ICU? Yeah, and then... In we... ICU. So we need your tefillot. The baby's name is Kinaret Emuna Miriam Bat Rachel Leah. Please, if you can have this baby in mind, the shiur is going to be dedicated to this tinoket, this beautiful baby girl who was able to come down into the world after a few years that you were trying. And in the mm -hmm. schut that you're here tonight, and that you brought people with you, and in the merit of the shi'ur, Bezat Hashem, we should see miracles. Oh, amen, amen, amen. Amen, amen, amen. And, of course, you know, sharing is caring. We have other people that I'd like to mention. There's a, uh, a woman who always sponsors. Her name is Ina Wishnia. I hope I'm, I'm pronouncing it right. Her mother needs a refuah shlema also. Sarah Bat Hana. We also want to thank Tammy Bauscher, an incredible supporter of Torah and of all Sarah. She's always donating. Tammy, thank you so very much. We uh, want to wish a special Hatzlacha, Meruba, to Azriella Chava Hicks's mother from Houston, Texas, who she told me never misses a shiur. They always sit together and they watch a shiur. Wow. Nechama Rachel Bat Sarah, she have a long life and happiness and nachat from her children and children's children because her daughter um, uh, donated money for her, 
for her that she should have tremendous atzlacha because she wrote about her mother that she's a true eshet chayil and very emotional. I want to say that I, I want to bless Cheyenne Towser, a young woman who wrote me that she's on her journey to conversion. She's six months away from moving to a new community and finally going through the process of Giyu. And I know, Cheyenne, I'm so sorry that I didn't yet get a chance to respond to you, but I did see your memo, and I, you brought me to tears with that, what you wrote. And we all here at Ohel Sara and everywhere out there in the world, whoever's watching, wish you tremendous success with your conversion journey and your new move to the new community. I don't know why you're not moving to Israel. <laughs> this is where you should be. This is where your new community should be. Yeah. But wherever you are, Hashem should give you tremendous success and a tremendous fulfillment. And you should continue to see Hashem's light in everything that you do. Okay, we have a lot of work to do today. This week's parasha, Balak, is one of the famous parashiot in the Torah that deals with textbook anti-Semitism. There was a king named Balak who despised the Jewish people. He came up with a diabolical plan in order to rid the world of Jews. This was the ancient form of the final solution. Now the one thing that all huge anti-Semites have in common is that they never fully succeed. The Haggadah of Pesach states it very clearly. They stand over us with intent to destroy. But God saves us from their hands. In this case over here, Balak came very close to annihilating us. That's why it's such a dramatic and significant story. And he enlisted the aid of the great a prophet of the Gentile nations, Bil'am, Bil'am HaRasha. At that time, a Kadosh Baruch who gave the Gentiles one prophet, because Hashem didn't want the Goyim to complain, ah, the Jews have prophets and, and we don't. So they were given a prophet. Sadly, Bil'am was involved with the dark side, with sorcery and black magic, which is something the Torah forbids. So although he had powers, he drew them from the Sitra Acha, from the dark forces, from dark Darth Vader. And, and he's regarded as a wicked man. He's Bil'am Harasha. So since Bil'am was an expert in black magic and the dark forces and sorcery, and because he was able to use his mouth in order to curse people, Balak hired him to curse the Jewish people. The plan was that they would place him on top of a mountain overlooking the Jewish encampment and at the golden moment of the day, the one moment of the day where God's anger is sparked, he should elicit a curse from his mouth against Am Yisrael. If Bilam could manage to curse B'nai Israel at the exact moment of the day when God gets angry, that would destroy us. That's how powerful Bilam was. And he asked for an exorbitant amount of money in order to accomplish his mission. Now, ladies, there were many times in history where we were in danger. But this event probably is one of the most dangerous situations in the history of our people because all the pieces of the puzzle were in play. Bil'am was on the mountain. His eyes were on B'nai Israel. He knew the exact moment of the day when God's anger is aroused. And he knew, he knew exactly what words he needs to say in order to create the most damage. So this was not only a matter of executing the job correctly to create the worst destruction. It was a matter of, do I get it done? But a miracle took place. First of all, on that specific day, HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided to withhold his anger. 
Secondly, instead of cursing us, HaKadosh Baruch Hu made Bil'am bless us with the most beautiful blessings. Some of those blessings are recited at our wedding ceremonies. The Chazan, the cantor at a Sephardic wedding, for example, he marches down the aisle singing, Matovu Ohalecha Yaakov, right? How good are your tents, Yaakov? Mishkenotecha Israel, your dwelling places, O Israel. These are the words of the anti Semite Bilam. Despite his plans to annihilate us, years later, not only are we still here, his words are blessings that are uttered at our weddings. That means that Bil'am's plan to use his mouth to curse us turned into an epic failure. Not only didn't he succeed in destroying us, he ended up providing us with the greatest blessings. And many of us know the story. You know the story, right? You know the story. But what we don't know is what the Gemara of Berachot states concerning this episode. You see, during the Talmudic era, there was a rabbinical council meeting where the Rabbanim were deciding if to include this entire story of Parashat Balak to be recited twice a day together with the recitation of Kriyat Shema. Did you believe it? Every day, twice a day, in the morning and in the evening, we recite Kriyat Shema. We say the word Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Right? Hear, O Israel, Hashem is our God, Hashem is one. Well, guess what? Well, I didn't get your name. Remind me. Sarah. Sarah, right. Remind me again. Neshama, how could I forget that name? <laughs> what a beautiful name. Anyway, so the Rabbanim wanted to, to make an addendum to the Kriyat Shema. They wanted to add the entire parashat Balak to the Kriyat Shema twice a day. You know how long that would take? I mean, can you imagine? To read just the parasha in Shul takes us 20 minutes. And the Rabbanim wanted us to read it in the morning and once at night. In addition to the Kriyat Shema, which is a few paragraphs long. Now, some of us have a hard time reading the Kriyat Shema. Can you imagine adding uh, Parashat Balak? At the end, though, they decided to vote against it. Why did they vote against it? The Gemara says, Mipnei, asks the Gemara, Mipnei ma lo kavu? How come they didn't institute it? Well, they didn't institute this reading, Mishum Torah Tzibur. They didn't want to impose a greater burden upon the congregation of Israel because there's so much time that we devote to prayer in addition to everything else we do that the Chachamim decided it might just be too much for us. So they did want to add this parasha to the Kriyat Shema, but then they changed their minds. My question is, how in the world does this parasha connect to the Kriyat Shema. How does the concept of the words behind the Kriyat Shema, which is to accept the yoke of heaven upon us, have anything to do with the story of Balak and Bilam, that they wanted to curse us? Why were the Chachamim even thinking about including this parasha into the Kriyat Shema? You hear the question, Neshama? In addition, the Rambam, Allah Shalom, reveals a very important principle, which is actually one of the 13 principles of faith. He writes the following. He says like this, HaMelech HaMashiach, the King Mashiach, Atid la'amod u'lehzir malchut David, bet David le'yoshna. In the future, when Mashiach comes, he's going to erect and he will restore the house of David to its former glory. Ubone Mikdash, and he's going to build the temple in Yerushalayim. Umekabet Snitcha Israel, and he's going to gather the remnants of Israel from among the exile nations. Makrivim Korbanot, we're going to start offering sacrifices again. And then the Rambam writes, Vechol Misha Eno Ma'amin Bo, 
And whoever does not believe in the concept of Mashiach, or or whoever does not await his arrival, very strong words he says, who kofer bechol Such a person is considered a defector of the Torah and of the words of Moshe. Which means not to believe in Mashiach or not to anticipate his arrival is considered, a, he says, a biblical uh, sin. And it's as though a person deserted authentic Judaism. And then he asks the Rambam, and where in the Torah Bechal do we see that there's going to be a Mashiach? After all, there is no Pasuk in the Torah that explicitly states that one day in the future there's going to be a Redeemer. And the Rambam found the answer in this parasha, in our parasha, Parashat Balak. Where do we see that? When Bil'am was making his prediction, he also blessed Am Yisrael about the future. And he said these words, Er'enu, I see, velo atta, but not now, not now. Ashurenu velo karov. I behold it, I can envision it, but it's not going to take place soon. I could see that in the far distant future, there is going to be, he says, a darach kochav mi Yaakov. A star will go forth from Yaakov. And the Rambam states that this star is referring to Mashiach. And then Bil'am continues. He says, Vikam shevet mi Israel, And a staff, a shevet, a tribe, is going to arise from the Jewish people, which is the tribe of Yehuda, the tribe of the Mashiach. So one of the prophecies that Bil'an reiterated about Am Yisrael on that mountain was not just the blessings that came out of his mouth, but he spoke about a redemption in the future, distant future. We, says Bil'am, are going to be redeemed by Mashiach. Interesting, interesting. The question is, if Bil'am's intention was to curse, to curse us, and Hashem turned his curses into blessings, why is he even mentioning the Mashiach? Why is he prophesizing that there's going to be a redemption? It seems like Bil'am felt compelled to tell us that one day in the future we're going to be redeemed. Why does he do that? And by the way, we feel that this is true. And we feel that it's very close. You don't have to be a prophet to know that the redemption, that the end of this exile is near. All the signs that the Gemara revealed to us are coming to life and they continue to reveal themselves. But my question is, why is Bil'am getting involved in the concept of Mashiach all of a sudden? Hear the question? So tonight, I'm going to share a secret with you based on the incredible words of the Gaon of Pinchas Friedman, Sheiskele Yamim Tovim Ve'arukim. As you know, whenever we study Torah, we don't just learn a specific chapter. Every story has its roots in another event that preceded it and one that came after it. Every parasha contains a spiritual DNA that's linked to another story in our history. And we just have to follow the DNA chain all the way back to find the original gene that created the parasha that we're currently reading. If we find the DNA of the parasha, then the essence and the depth of our parasha can be revealed. It's then that we could arrive at the proper conclusions. Now, ladies, I have to say that that's very challenging because we literally have to go on a treasure hunt to try to find clues that will ultimately lead us to the treasure. So in this case here, we have to find 
where in our history there was another anti-Semite like Bil'am who had the intention of destroying Am Yisrael. You know, is there another event in Jewish history where an anti-Semite failed in his mission like Bil'am did? Hitler's before Bil'am, remember we need to trace the DNA chain back before. Meaning something happened before that created this parasha. Meaning is there a similar situation where someone attempted to annihilate Am Yisrael through the use of his mouth, but instead, before, before uh, Bil'am, but instead blessings spewed forth just like the story of Bil'am. That's a difficult undertaking, yeah, by the way. Do you have someone? Yeah. Who? Lavan. Oh, that's a good one. Meaning, very good. Isa, Isa. The, question, the question was, where are we going to find the deja vu scenario where this happened before? If we can pinpoint it, that's going to open the door to reveal all the secrets. Well, guess what? You got it. You have the clue over there. You have the clue. The Remez appears actually in Parashat Vayetze, in Sefer Bereshit. In that parasha, Yaakov Avinu, Allah Shalom, travels to Haran in order to find a wife and establish a Jewish home. Mm -hmm. He arrives at his uncle's house, Lavan, and it's there in Lavan's house that he bears the Shvatim, the holy tribes. And Yaakov eventually ends up marrying four of Lavan's daughters, Rachel, Leah, Bilha, and Zilpa. You got two of the names there. <laughs> and then as a result, Am Yisrael, the nation of Israel is formed over there. Now, uh, remind me what your name is. Shoshana. Shoshana, that your name, you didn't tell me your name, so Baruch Hashem. Shoshana, at that time, Am Yisrael did not consist of millions of people. It was comprised of Yaakov, his four wives, and his 11 children because Binyamin had not yet been born. But that's it. The entire nation consisted of 16 people. That's why it was so important for Yaakov's family to be preserved because it's very easy to kill a nation that totals 16 people. You don't need a massive bomb or, or, or a large number of guns in order to kill 16 people. But anyhow, the Torah wants us to know that Lavan's intention was to kill Yaakov, his wives, and all the children. Once his daughters converted to Judaism, once they accepted the yoke of heaven upon themselves, and they did away with idolatry and they believed in the one true God, Lavan didn't consider them his daughters anymore. So he wanted to annihilate them all. How do we know this? Shoshana, you, got, you hit the nail on the head with Lavan. But how do we know this? What did Lavan try to do? He does try to... A dream comes to Lavan, and uh, Hashem comes to him in a dream and says, don't bless them or curse them. Hmm. Listen, your mother... Not, you want to be my chavruta? You want to... Oh, wow, wow. Is this the question? How do we know this? Uh, very good, because the Torah tells us. The Torah tells us. Yaakov actually testifies to that, to that fact when he says the words Arami Lavan, Lavan, the one who came from Aram, Oved, he tried to destroy me. But, and, and by the way, pointing to your words, where do we see Bemet that Lavan tried to destroy Yaakov? We see it in the text, it's, the text itself. After Yaakov realized that uh, I'm living here in a precarious situation, he gathered his wives and he informed them that they were going to have to make a, a kind of a quickie exit from Lavan's house without informing anybody. And indeed, Yaakov and his entire family left Lavan's house quickly, quietly, and they took all the possessions with them. All of a sudden, the Pasuk states, Vayugad le Lavan bayom hashlishi ki varach Yaakov. On the third day after Yaakov's departure, Lavan is informed that Yaakov and the whole family took off. They fled. What happens? 
Lavan decides to chase after Yaakov and the whole family. And the Pasuk tells us, Vayadbekoto beha ha gilad. Lavan overtook Yaakov at Mount Gilad. He catches up to Yaakov. Why did Lavan chase after Yaakov and the family? What, did he want to see them off with a box of chocolates and a bouquet of flowers? No, that was not his intention. Lavan's intention was to kill Yaakov and the whole family. How do we know? Because of the next pasuk that states the following. Ready, Shoshana? Vayavo Elokim el Lavan ha'aromim b'chalom ha'layla. And God came to Lavan the Aramean in a dream of the night. Vayomer lo, and he said to him, Hishamer lecha, beware, I'm warning you. Pen tedaberim Yaakov mitov adra, lest you speak with Yaakov either good or evil. Shoshana, wait. Speak? What do you mean, lest you speak? Why is speaking mentioned here? Lavan, let him talk all he wants, as long as he doesn't actively do anything. What's with the speaking? Oh, very good. Chachamim tell us that Lavan had the power of speech, and he knew how to invoke a curse upon a person. Lavan speaking? That was a dangerous situation. If he would utter the right words at the right time, he'd succeed in, in destroying Yaakov and the entire family. So Lavan's intention was to catch up to Yaakov, confront him face to face, and curse him. But Lavan was warned by Hashem. God says, don't even think of speaking to Yaakov. And this scenario repeats itself later on in the story of Bil'am. He was hired by Balak to curse Am Yisrael. But before accepting, Bil'am said, look, uh, Balak, before I accept the job, I have to ask God if he allows me to curse the Jewish people. And what does the pasuk in our parasha state? Vayavo Elokim el Bil'am. And God came to Bil'am. These are the identical words are, as that of Lavan. Hashem comes to Bil'am in a dream and he says to him, Lo mahem. You shouldn't go with Balak's people. Lo ta'or ta'am. You shall not curse the nation. Ki baruchu. For they are blessed. So here we go, ladies. Here we see that the roots of Parashat Balak are really in Parashat Vayetze. And what happens in Vayetze? After Lavan catches up with Yaakov and they have that face-to-face -face encounter, what does the Pasuk in Sefer Bereshit tell us, Neshama? Don't worry, I don't expect you to tell. No. <laughs> I saw your face like, oh, I hope she doesn't expect me to tell. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> he says, <laughs> Lavan tells Yaakov the following. He says, Yesh le'el yadi la'asot imachem ra. I have the power to inflict evil upon you. I have the power to kill you. But I can't. You know why? Ve'eloke avichem emesh amar elai lemor Because the God of your father spoke to me last night and he said to me, He shamer lecha midaber im Yaakov mitov adra. He warned me, beware of speaking to Yaakov either good or evil. Your God warned me that I can't speak to you not good or not bad. That's exactly what happened with Bilam. Bilam says, I want to curse Am Yisrael, but God is not allowing me to. So the DNA of this week's parasha is rooted in parashat Vayetzeh with Lavan and Yaakov. It all began with Lavan Ha'arami. So far so good? Is this interesting at all? But Lavan, Lavan didn't go through with it, right? He didn't even try. Bilam really, really wait, tried. Wait, oh, very no, good, Lavan. very good. Lavan tried. Uh, very good. You're gonna, we're gonna see soon. We're gonna see soon. You know what you're, you're saying, about Sarah? You're on the ball. You're gonna see soon because there's more. There's more. There's more. The Yariya Kadosh Alav Shalom wrote the following in a sefer titled Etz Chaim. He says like this. Ki Lavan Ha'arami, Avi Aviv Shel Bil'am. Lavan Ha'arami was Bil'am's grandfather. 
Yes. And he says, Vehu atzmo nitgalgel bebilam. Lavan himself was reincarnated into Bilam, his grandson. When Lavan died, the Ari says, a part of his soul, a part like a nitzotz, a spark of his neshama, entered his grandson Bilam. So when we see Bilam, it's not really Bilam. He's AKA, he's also known as Lavan Ha'arami. But then the Ari says the following. Where did Bil Bil'am learn all of the secrets of the, the dark side, black magic and sorcery from? From his grandfather, Lavan. Lavan was one of the biggest sorcerers of his time and he taught all the secrets of the dark side and how to access those evil powers and how to force those powers to do your bidding to his grandson Bil'am. So Bil'am graduated with honors and he's the valedictorian of the Harvard School of Sorcery. <laughs> and, and who's the dean of the university? Who's the dean? His grandfather, Lavan. Then the Ari tells us that's the reason why both Lavan and Bil'am had an intention to curse Am Yisrael because they were the same person. Now, in actuality, to answer your question, or what it wasn't a question, what you said earlier, Bil'am was supposed to correct and rectify his grandfather's sin. Mm -hmm. Lavan's sin wasn't that, it, he didn't do anything at the end, but Lavan's sin was that he wanted to curse Yaakov and the entire family and to destroy them. But when Lavan was reincarnated into Bil'am, Instead of rectifying that sin, he wanted to commit the same devious plan. Since Bil'am was the Gilgul of Lavan, in the next lifetime, he should have rectified by blessing Am Yisrael all by himself. But instead, he failed twice in his first and second Gilgul. And it gets even worse than this, Sarah. Does anybody know how Bil'am ultimately died, Shishana? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, Shishana, I'll give you a hint. It was a very odd death. It was a very odd death that, that, that the Targum Yonatan ben Uziel, Allah wa Shalom, explains to us. I think Moshe killed him and he flew up for some reason. I'm not sure. Half the story you got right. Half the story you got right. Okay, half is also good. He writes that like this. He writes that Bil'am was actually killed by the sword. Who killed him? Pinchas. We all know who Pinchas is. He appears in next week's parasha. Next week. How did Pinchas kill him? He killed him in an amazing way. You see, when Pinchas was chasing Bil'am who was on the run, Bil'am turned around and he saw Pinchas running after him holding a sword. And he knew that if Pinchas caught up to him, that's it, finito bambino. It's over. What did Bil'am do? He used his skills as a sorcerer and he propelled himself upward to float in the sky. Pinchas, we're talking uh, the Star Wars over here going on. <laughs> Pinchas saw him trying to escape through sorcery and he says, hey, you tipesh, you fool, you think you're the only one who has the ability to levitate? Immediately, Pinchas recited a very powerful name of Hashem, and lo and behold, he too was soaring in the heavens. Pinchas was now chasing Bil'am in the sky. That's why it says, Star Wars, and he catches him by the head, meaning he goes on top of him and he catches him by the head. Takes out his sword in the middle of the air in order to kill him. But Bilam starts to cry and beg and he says, please don't kill me. If you spare me, I swear to you that all the days of my life, I won't curse the Jewish nation. What, uh, could you believe this guy, Neshama? <laughs> Bilam wants to be rewarded for not cursing anybody. He can't say, he can't say, if you let me go, I promise to bless the nation. I'll be good to Am Yisrael. What a rasha. He cannot even utter from his mouth a positive gesture towards the Jewish people, even at the time of his own death. 
So he wants to be rewarded for not killing us. <laughs> but what does Pinchas tell Bil'am? Says the Tagum. He says, I know who you are. You are Lavan Ha'arami. You're the one who wanted to destroy Yaakov and his entire household, which means you're a liar. This isn't the first time you're trying to hurt Am Yisrael. You're telling me that you're not going to do it anymore, but you're a Rasha. You did it once before when you were Lavan, and in that lifetime you also said, oh, you know, I could have killed Yaakov, but God warned me not to. But then you come back the second time as a Gilgul, and you're doing it again? So you lost your credibility. That's when Pinchas raised his sword and whoosh, killed him. Now, Shoshana. So I'm going to you straight away. Yeah. <laughs> How old was Bil'am when he died? Oh, well, we got her stumped. <laughs> Have to make a shechiyah. <laughs> The Ariya Kadosh writes that he died at the young age of 33. No way. He was 33? Yeah, yeah. And then in those days, it was considered wow, like very young. very young. That's like a baby. Wow. That's a baby. And, and, and the Ari wonders, why did he die when he was just 33 years old? Listen to another part of the story. Chachamim tell us that we should be the kinds of people who keep their word. The Gemara comments that if you make a commitment to somebody and you don't keep your word, there are always witnesses present who bear testimony to those words. Even though you think there might not be any witnesses when you made your com commitment, there's always someone or something who's watching. And that witness, God forbid, can take revenge on the person who did not keep his word. That means you can never get away with anything because there are witnesses that testify if you didn't keep your word. So the Gemara tells us a fascinating story of a young boy who promised a young maiden that he'd marry her. He proposed to her and she said, but, but there are no witnesses here who could attest to the fact that you're committing yourself to me. So how am I going to know that you're really going to keep your word, that we're engaged? He looked around and he saw a weasel. Next to the weasel he saw a bull, a pit. He pointed to both of them and he said, these two are going to be the witnesses. Now the girl was a pure and simple girl and she accepted his marriage proposal and they were betrothed. What happened? He went away and what do you think took place? He forgot about his promise to her, who cares? And eventually he married somebody else. And now this poor girl in the olden days, you know, once you're engaged, you're engaged. So, so now this poor girl is locked into this betrothal. She doesn't know where he is. But in those days, you, you, you can't just undo. And he marries this other girl and his new wife had a baby. The baby, the Gemara says, and one of the most horrific stories was attacked and by a weasel and died. The man's wife realized that this is not a regular death. This is not a normal situation. Something is going on over here. It's very rare for a little baby to be devoured by a weasel. But she too moved on and she wanted to forget about it and she had another child. You know what happened to the second one? He fell into a pit and he died. So now the wife approaches her husband and she says, this is beyond me. This is strike two. Tell me what is going on. And he says, I have to confess that there was another girl that I once met and I proposed marriage to her. I didn't know what I was doing because I was a, I was a young man. But I told her that the weasel and the pit were going to be my witnesses, that I'm committed to her. So it seems that these two witnesses are coming back to take revenge on me because I did not keep my word. So the wife says, I feel 
very badly for the other girl. You'll have to divorce me and marry her. Gemara says that's what happened. But what's the point of this Gemara? The Gemara is telling us that the witnesses who hear us and see our actions can sometimes come back to take revenge if we don't keep our word. And there's a reason why I'm telling you this. Let's proceed further and go back to Yaakov Avinu for a moment. When Lavan met up with Yaakov and admitted that he was going to kill him and the entire family, Yaakov says to him, Lavan, let us make a peace treaty. You wanted to kill me. God came to you in a dream and stopped you. That's concerning today. But how do I know that in the future you're not going to try to kill me again? So let's create a peace treaty that says, I won't do battle against you, and you won't do, bat do battle against me. What did they do? Yaakov says like this in the Pasuk. Ve'ata, and now. Lecha nichreta brit. Come, let us make a covenant. Ani ve'ata, me and you. Ve'haya le'ed. And let that brit be a witness. Be'ni u'venecha, between me and you. Yaakov says, this treaty we're going to make over here, the sign that we're going to create between us, this monument here, that's going to be our witness. Because they believed, and the Gemara says so too, if you designate an inanimate object to be a witness, it will bear witness. You could energize an inanimate object with the words, this is my witness. And then that object will stand for you as a witness. What did Yaakov do? Vayikach Yaakov Evan. Yaakov took a stone. Vayerimeha Matseva. And he erected a type of monument. Vayomer Yaakov Le'echav. And then Yaakov told his kinsmen, his children, Liktu Avanim. Everybody, gather stones. Vayikru Avanim. And they all took stones. Vayaasu gal. And they made a pile. Vayochlu sham al hagal. And they ate there by the pile. There was a big stone. And they added small stones to it. Like a monument of some kind. They erected something called a gal. A gal is a pile of stones. Why the stones? Not only that, but they ate near this pile of stones as a sign of their priest peace treaty. And then Lavan says, Hagal Hazeh, this pile of stones, Ed, is a witness. Beidni uvencha hayom, between me and you today. Alken, therefore, Karashemo, he called that place. Galed. Galed. Yes. Lavan said, I accept this gal, this monument over here, as a peace treaty between us, that I will not wage war against you, and you will not do battle against me, and we are calling upon God to verify what happened here today. This monument here is our witness. That's unbelievable. But did Lavan keep his word? <coughs> did Lavan keep his word? He didn't. Because when he came back in his Gilgul as Bil'am, you know what he should have done when Balak hired him? He should have said, listen, I'm not allowed to curse Yaakov's children. There was a peace treaty that my grandfather entered into with the Jewish nation. There was a Gal. A monument erected that bears witness to that peace treaty. So I'm very sorry, but I'm not allowed to do anything against them. And then Balak would have said, what do you mean? Your family made a peace treaty with a pile of stones as their witness? And Bil'am would have said, yes, yes, that gal is the Ed. It's the witness. That's how it works, Balak. An inanimate object can be a witness. So I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to heed your request. But instead, what did Bilam do? 
He pretended as though there was never any pact made at all. So what happened? Shoshana, you can fill in the blanks. <laughs> Bilam begins his journey towards the encampment of Am Yisrael so that he could curse them. And suddenly the Pasuk states, Vatere ha'aton et malach Hashem. Bilam's famous donkey sees an angel appearing before her who blocks her path. The donkey is startled, she's frightened, she's veering to the left, she's veering to the right, she's veering to both sides. Vatelachetz el hakir. And her, she found herself being pressed against the side wall because it was a narrow path. And whose leg, leg is hanging on the side of the donkey? Bilam. Who, Bilam, very good, Bilam's leg. What happened <coughs> to his leg? Vatelachetz et regel Bilam el hakir. The donkey pressed Bil'am's leg against the wall. Does anybody know which wall this was? Was this the Kotel Amaravi? The Western Wall? It was, the was it the Great Wall of China? No. Which wall was this? When Bil'am and his donkey were traveling, there was a wall that the Torah calls a Gader or in some of the Pesukim Ekir, says Rashi. You should know that when the Torah uses the word Gader, it means a fence of stones. That's nice to know, but who cares what the fence is made out of? Why does Rashi feel a need to tell us that the Gader was made out of stones? Rashi goes out of his way to inform us that this fence was made of stones. You know why? Because the last time we read about these stones was when Lavan used, used them to erect a monument that would bear witness to the peace treaty between him and Yaakov. So the stones were coming back to tell Bil'am, you Bil'am, the Gilgul of Lavan, you didn't keep your word. You're now on your way to curse the Jewish people. So who are the ones testifying against Bil'am? The stones, the monument itself. Those stones came back and they began to crush Bil'am's leg. And on this Pasuk, the Targum Yonatan ben Oziel states, the angel was sent in order to cause the donkey to veer to the right and to veer to the left and to steer her against the wall. And what was this wall? Listen to the Targum's language. He says, Atar, this was the place, the Akim Yaakov and Lavan. That place was where Yaakov and Lavan established their peace treaty. Do you believe that? Right there. That's why the wall punished Bilam, because the stones that made up that wall were part of that original gal, the original witnesses. They came back to testify concerning the peace treaty and promise that was made between Yaakov and Lavan. Now ladies, I want to tell you that interestingly, there is the halakha in the Torah concerning one of the four deaths sanctioned by the tribunal. Now, Halakha says that, God forbid, if someone has to be put to death by stoning, who's the first one to throw the stone? It's hard to pick up a stone and throw it at somebody. The Torah in Sefer Devarim says, Yad ha'edim tiyebo barishona lehamito. The hand of the witnesses who came to testify against this person should be the first ones to put him to death. They testified against him. In our case over here, the witnesses see that Bil'am is in contempt of the peace treaty. Could you believe this? Not only that, but the Ariya Kadosh asks, after Bil'am died, where did his neshama go? What happened to his soul? The Ari writes that his soul was reincarnated into a stone. 
he came back in a Gilgul as a rock. And he explains the Ari that sometimes Rashaim, not all the time, Rashaim are sometimes reincarnated into stones. And that's fascinating because did you ever wonder why some people who walk down the street and they see a rock, they have this instinctive desire to they just kick it out of nowhere? And we tell them, why are you kicking the rock? Why are you kicking the rock? The Ari says, Hashem made it like that. Hashem made it like that. Because there are times that there's a wicked soul reincarnated in that rock. So when you kick the stone for no reason at all, or you pick up the stone and you fling it far away for no reason at all, that's a type of punishment for that soul that's in, embedded in that inanimate object. And you see, sometimes we do things without realizing that there's a greater purpose behind our actions. But, but the question is, why was Bil'am reincarnated into a stone? So the Yerik writes, there's a very good reason for this. You see, in Judaism, a rock is considered a domem. It's an inanimate object. But what else does the word domem mean? It comes from the word dom or vaidom, which means to be silent. A rock is silent. A stone cannot speak. So Hashem says to Bil'am, this is a punishment that's midah, keneged midah, measure for measure. You used your mouth to speak against Am Yisrael, so now you'll go from being the medaber, the one who speaks, to the one who is domem, the one who is silent. You will become an inanimate object, you'll be a stone. And Bil'am was reincarnated into a stone. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm curious to know which stone Bil'am was reincarnated in. We know which stone? Ari says that he came back as one of the stones on that wall. Oh. Wow. Not only that, but what was that original pile of stones called? Do you remember? What was it called? A gal, a gal. The pile of stones was called a gal. What's the numerical value of the word gal? Thirty-three. Very good. Thirty-three. Oh. That's why Bilam died at the young 33. age of thirty-three. The Ari says he went against the gal, against the monument that was erected as a witness of the peace treaty. And therefore he died at the age of Gal, at the age of 33. And you know why that, they called that pile of stones a Gal, says the Ari? He says because the word Gal is spelled Gimel Lamed. And that's really a secret code. It's Rashi Tevot for the words Gilgul Lavan. This rock eventually became the Gilgul, the reincarnation of Lavan. So what happened? Bil'am, also known as Lavan, was in that stone. And after a number of years, Akadosh Baruch Hu says, okay, so it's time for Bil'am slash Lavan to come out from the stone. I want to see if he will finally correct his sin and rectify. So now we're talking about chance number four. Started with Lavan, then Bil'am, then he was a stone, mm -hmm. okay. and now Hashem wanted to give him one more chance to do a tikkun. So in Sefer Shmuel Aleph, David HaMelech, Alav HaShalom, was running away from Shaul, and he needed food. And in the city where he was hiding, there was a wealthy man whose wife was a woman named Avigail. Avigail eventually becomes one of David's wives, but at this point in the story, she was married to a wealthy man who was very wicked. Anyhow, David needed food for himself and the men that he was with, so he sent a messenger to the wealthy man saying, Shalom to you and to your family. 
I mean no harm. I'm only requesting that you please give us some food to eat. We're hungry, <coughs> we're tired, we're on the run. Could you spare some food for us? And the man sent a message back to David saying, You? Who do you think you are? You're a good for nothing, you're a nobody, you're a rebel, you're a zero. This man proceeded to call David Amelech every name in the book. Who was this man? What was his name? Who was the man who cursed David when he was in dire straits, when he was down and out? The man's name was... She got it again. So good. The man's name was Naval. And the Ariya Kadosh says that the name Naval shares the same letters as the name Lavan. Lavan came back a fourth time in order to correct the mouth that in the other three Gilgulim you had a problem with. Or he, or he failed again. HaKadosh Baruch Hu in his mercy wanted to offer him another chance to rectify his sin and send David as an opportunity for him to correct. Neshama, this is answering your question. What's going on with Bil'am? Does he ever, you know, correct his way? If Naval would have told David, God bless you King David. Bless your family and all those with you and of course I'm going to feed you. What an honor it is for me to have the next king of Israel here. That would have rectified everything. Mm. Instead, what does he tell him? You're a good for nothing. You're a zero. You're worthless. You're a rebel. And who says I even believe you should be king? Now, what happens? Avigail, <coughs> Naval's wife, realized that there are going to be grave consequences for her husband's ugly words. So she... she prepares like wagon loads of food and, and, and cakes and all that to David and she goes and she pleads to, to David for mercy on her husband's behalf <coughs> and she says please he doesn't know what he's doing please spare him and David acquiesces but what does the pasuk and the David tell us happened to Naval on that night he died but listen to the way he died you won't believe what the Pasuk states. Vayamot libo bekirbo. Thank you so much. And his heart died within him. Vehu hayale even. And it became like a stone. You know what that means? Neshama? Okay, literally it means that his heart turned to stone. But the deep explanation is that when he realized, when Naval realized that he didn't make the tikkun, vehu hayale even, when he realized he was previously a stone, literally, vehu hayale even, he was once a stone, and he was now given a chance to correct his ways in his mouth, and he failed again, and instead of blessing David, he cursed him, the Navi says he turned into a stone and he died. So we see from here that the story is ongoing and explains a lot. We begin to understand the connections now between the story so that when we hear the name Lavan, we know it's who? Who? Bil'am. And Bil'am is Naval. And when we hear about the Gal, the pile of stones, we know it's the same wall that Bil'am's leg was crushed into. And by the way, speaking of, of Bil'am's leg, in Hebrew, the word for leg is what? Regel, that's this, right? Regel. Rav Pinchas Friedman says that the word regel is also a code. It's Rasha Tevot for the words Rasha Gilgul Lavan. The reason why we're, 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 we're addressing his leg is because we have to know that this guy over here is the wicked reincarnation of Lavan. And in our real, he says, and, and in the word ragel is the word gal, the pile of stones itself. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. By the way, this is an incredible way of learning Torah. Because who would have ever thought 
that Bilam was somehow connected to Lavan. Lavan is somehow connected to Naval. There's a stone going here. But we're learning Bilam is actually the sequel to the story of Lavan. Mm -hmm. So that's why we always need to go back to the beginning to understand why things transpire later on in history the way they do. And then when we connect the two stories, there's an entire revelation of wondrous thoughts that we never dreamed of that come to life. So there we have it. We have an episode in the Torah that took place before the story of Bil'am that involved a man, Lavan, who attempted to curse Bnei Israel with his mouth and failed miserably. Instead, he made a peace treaty with Yaakov, and there was a blessing. And by the way, what does it mean that there was a blessing? That's the point, by the way, that I wanted to share with you tonight. Because there's a very powerful message over here. Every day, we recite the words, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Hear, O Israel, Hashem is our God, Hashem is one. What does it mean that Hashem is Echad, that God is one? On a simple level, we know that God is not divided into more than one entity. He's one. He's not two. He's not three. We know that. But there's something else we learn from that Pasuk. Echad, one, means that there's no other force in this world that works independently without Hashem's control. Even the Malachim, even the angels who we assume are powerful, they don't have an independent power. The Malachim only possess power because Hashem gives it to them. Echad means that there's one source of energy that's emanating from everything. There isn't a single creation that possesses an independent power and just can do what it wants. That includes the Rashaim, the wicked people out there who think that if they tap into black magic or sorcery or something, they're then independently separated as a, as a, as a separate entity from Hashem. But that's the point, because when we see the Rashaim engaging, engaging in all kinds of bizarre actions, we might think, oh, they're using their forces of black magic, they possess evil powers, and, and the Chachamim tells us, no, that's a mistake. You have to remember Hashem Echad. All powers come from Hashem. And he said, and, and the Chachamim say, there are times that when Hashem wants to show us that he's the Echad, he'll use the Rasha, he'll use a wicked person to do his will. I'll give you an example. Hashem wants to show us that He's the one controlling the entire world. So He says, I'm going to use the Rasha to bring the Bracha, to bring blessings upon Am Yisrael. Now the last thing a Rasha wants to do is bless us. Hashem knows that. So Hashem says, you think you're the one in control? Well, guess what? I'm going to use you to bring the bracha. And the Rasha says, but I don't want to bless the Jewish people. And Hashem says, I I'm the Echad. I'm the one who's in control, not you. Take Pao for example. If you would ask him, what's your goal? Pao was like Hitler, Yemachshemo. He would have said, pen yirbe. My goal is to kill the Redeemer of the Jewish people, to assimilate the Jews and eradicate their existence as a people. And Hashem says, you want to do away with Am Yisrael? You want to destroy the Redeemer? Paro, I'm going to see to it that you'll be the one to save the Redeemer. You're going to save Moshe and he's going to be raised in your palace sitting on your lap. You're going to feed him applesauce in the morning and you're going to take him to the park in the afternoon. You're going to raise the leader and redeemer of Am Yisrael. That's exactly what happened. Moshe Rabbeinu was raised by Pao. And at the end, 
Chachamim say, Paro is scratching his head. He's wondering, how did that happen? How did that... Here I was trying everything in my power to be rid of the Jewish people and their Redeemer. How did this happen? And Hashem says, it happened because you decided that you are the one in charge. But I'm the one that's running the world. Hashem Echad. So when we see that Hashem causes the Rashaim to fulfill His will, like in the case of Paro, Lavan, Bilam, etc. That's where you see that there is truly no independent power in the world that exists outside of Hashem. There are many times <coughs> when HaKadosh Baruch Hu uses the Rasha who has evil plans to bring the prosperity and blessings to Am Yisrael. And over here we have the classic example. Because the Torah tells us that the biggest anti-Semite of his time was Lavan. Hashem knew that Lavan was an anti-Semite. Lavan attempted to murder the entire household of Yaakov. That was his goal, to kill them all. But at the end of the day, look at what he accomplished. Lavan deserves a lot of credit for building the infrastructure of Am Yisrael. First of all, Lavan gave his four daughters as wives to Yaakov. <laughs> now, now okay, we, we know he tried to trick Yaakov and then he replaced Rachel with Leah the night of the wedding, but that too was designed by Hashem because most of the holy tribes of Israel came from who? From Leah. She gave birth to six of the twelve Shvatim. That means she was Zoycha to bear the majority of the tribes. So he, Lavan's thinking, He's going to switch Rachel and Le'ah. That's going to destroy the plans of constructing Am Yisrael. But at the end of the day, he was helping to build Am Yisrael. So what do we tell Lavan? Lavan, chazaku baruch. Thank you. It's good that you first gave Le'ah to Yaakov. Because that's how Am Yisrael came, had to come to fruition. The more Lavan tried to destroy us, the more he failed the more he accomplished. So Hashem says, you forget that Hashem is a chad. There is no other power or entity besides me. So when we observe the Rashaim of old, and we notice how Hashem used them to fulfill His will, and not their original plans, that's where we truly see that Hashem is a chad, and that no one out there can do anything harmful if Hashem does not will it and more. Hashem is going to create a scenario where the person who wishes to create harm will one day turn around and create the greatest good against their original plan. That means that after Yaakov escaped from Lavan's house with his entire family, with all of Am Yisrael intact and flourishing, Lavan is wondering how did they get away? How, how did all this happen under his watch? They became a family. They became a nation. What do you mean, how did all this happen? It happened because of you. Well, we thank you for it. Because of you, Yaakov had four wives who gave birth to the 12 Shvatim. You made it happen, Lavan. And Lavan is dumbfounded. He says, that was not my intention. My intention was to kill Yaakov and his entire family. I don't know what happened here. I don't know. And Hashem says, I'll tell you what happened. I'm Echad. I'm one. And you're nothing. That's the difference. And because you have zero powers, because you are not the Echad, all the scheming in the world will never come to fruition because I'm the Echad. I'm the one who controls the world. So listen to what happened next, and then I'll let you go. By the way, thank you so much for being so patient. And I know it's late. But listen to what happened next. Balak visits this great prophet of the Gentiles, and he says, Bilam, you see all the Jewish people who are flourishing and roaming around the desert free as a bird? It's all your fault. It's your fault. Because you're really Lavan. 
You're the one who helped to create these people. You're the one who made sure they come to fruition. So the right thing for you to do, if you want to make a tikkun for that, you have to destroy them all. So you, you understand what Balak's intention was? Why did he choose Balaam to do the dirty work? Because he says, you're responsible for their existence to begin with. You allowed Yaakov to live in your house. You gave him your daughters as wives. He fathered the tribes uh, that are your grandchildren in your domain. You had so many opportunities to destroy Yaakov and the entire household of Israel, and you did not. So, I'm sorry, this is your responsibility. If there's a Jewish crisis, a Jewish problem in the world, it's because you, Bil'am, who's really Lavan, you're the one who caused it all. So it's only right that you should be the one to solve the Jewish problem. Ladies, this is the mindset of the anti-Semites. They think that their tikkun is to succeed in finally destroying us when all others uh, before them failed. They think they have to make a tikkun by finally getting the job done <laughs> in their incarnation. And Bilal says to Balak, you know what, you're right. I made a big boo-boo. I don't know how I allowed this to happen. They got me in the form of Gilgul. They got me. They somehow they manipulated me. But this time, I'm not going to fail. I'm not going to allow them to have any influence over me. This time, I'm going to curse them and be rid of them once and for all. But I forgot that there's an echad in the world. So Hashem says, what? You're going back to your original plan of 500 years ago? Don't you realize that the same echad who foiled your plans all those years ago is the same Echad who's not going to allow it to happen this time. And when Bil'am is standing on the mountaintop with an overview of the entire Jewish encampment, and he's ready to curse Am Yisrael, and he's waiting for the right moment of the day, what does God do? Bil'am opens his mouth, and the greatest blessings pour forth. Here we go again. That's exactly what happened in the first Gilgul. Bil'am, in your first incarnation, you tried to destroy Am Yisrael, and in the end you helped to form the nation. And now as Bil'am, you think you could cause, cause their ultimate demise, and what happens? God says, Tiskel mitzvot. Thank you for blessing the people. And by the way, from now on, we're going to use your blessings at the weddings of all generations to come. And Bil'am says, well, I was, I, I was trying to see to it that there shouldn't be any more Jewish weddings. How did that happen? And Hashem said, it happened because you're not the Echad. I am. And not only are there going to be Jewish weddings, but your blessings are going to enhance the Jewish weddings. Your words of praise about Am Yisrael are going to be quoted at every chuppah. They're not going to quote Edgar Allan Poe. They're going to quote you, saying, Matovu ohalecha Yaakov, mishkenotecha Yisrael. And Bil'am says, me? No! He's like the wicked witch of the West. He's melting. Don't quote me. I don't want to be quoted. All those praises were not even my intention. And Hashem says, we are going to quote you whether you like it or not. And Bil'am is going crazy. Please don't quote me. Please don't quote me. And, and the Ari says, that's really the biggest curse of Bil'am. That's his Gehenna. Mm. That's his Gehenna. Bil Bil'am, he wants the curse. And instead, he felt cursed because we continue to quote his blessings at our weddings. Every time a Jewish couple gets married, every time more Jewish children are born into the world, every time there's another Brit Milah, every time there's a little baby that's born at Tinoket, Bil'am is burning and turning in his grave. He says, none of this is what I had in mind. My intention was to destroy the Jewish people. And Hashem says, but I'm the Achad. You don't have any control, and I'm going to use you as the tool not to do what you want, but what I want. So it's now, Neshama, that we can understand 
why the Rabbanim and the Gemara wanted to include the story of Bilam specifically in the Kriyat Shema. If you remember, we said that the Rabbanim wanted to add this Parsha to the recitation of Shema that we recite twice a day, and we wondered, what's the connection between the story of Bilam and the Tefillah of Kriyat Shema? Now you know, Neshama, because our Parsha over here is a perfect example of what the words Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad are all about. Hashem says, even though it appears that the Rishayim are attempting to do things that you cannot understand, you should know that I'm using them in order to bring the final Tikkun to Am Yisrael. Those Rishayim over there, they're merely puppets. They have no independent power. The enemies of Am Yisrael are powerless. Even though it looks like they're trying to hurt us, Hashem is just using them as the instrument to create the greatest good. I'll give you an example of the Mashiach, because we spoke why in heaven's name is Bal'am bringing the Mashiach, right? <coughs> the Gemara Navoda says, uh, Gemara Navoda Zara says, when Mashiach comes, the Goim are going to come to Hashem, and they're going to say, God, we want to be rewarded. And Hashem will ask, well, what do you want to be rewarded for? And they'll say, Hashem, look around. You see all these highways? You see these bridges we constructed? We built tunnels and these beautiful cities? And we did it all for the sake of the Jewish people. And Hashem will say, uh, you did it for the sake of Am Yisrael. You did it for yourselves so that you could line your own pockets with money. You didn't do it for Am Yisrael. And one of the Rabbanim comments on this Gemara and he asks, is it possible that the Goyim are going to lie straight to Hashem? I mean, are they really going to say that they built the Verrazano Bridge <laughs> in New York for the sake of the Jewish people? That's a lie. Would they really lie to God? And the rabbi answers beautifully. He says, when Mashiach comes, Hashem is going to reveal how everything the Goyim did in this world, Be'emet, was indeed, ultimately, for the sake of Am Yisrael's benefit. And it's going to be clear to the Gentiles how everything they did was really for our sake. So in truth, it's not really going to be a lie as a matter of fact, by the way, when Ravaran Kotler, Allah Shalom, was once driving across the Verrazano Bridge, he told the student, this bridge was built so that the young boys from Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York, can travel easily back and forth so they can study in our Lakewood Yeshiva. That's why they built this bridge. So the student said, Kvodarav, uh, the Goyim are also using this bridge. Everybody's using the bridge. So Rav Kotler said, that's fine. No problem. There's no, no, no rule that says only we could benefit from the bridge. Others can also benefit from it. But in reality, it's for the sake of Am Yisrael. And then he says, and I must add that it doesn't mean when they were constructing the bridge that it was the kavanah to help us. The contractor and the architect did not say, we are building this bridge over here to make it easier for the Jewish people to learn Torah in the lake with yeshiva. No, he says. But Hashem says, the going don't even know what it is they're really doing and what it is that I'm really doing. I'm using them as an instrument for the good, for Am Yisrael. They think they're doing it to charge tolls and to make money for the city. But in actuality, they're building it so that the Jewish people can have easier access from one city to the next so that they could experience the Jews a different kind of learning and spiritual elevation in other parts of the country. So whether the Goyim know it or not, everything they do, whether good or seemingly harmful, is for the ultimate benefit of Am Yisrael. So the Gemara is teaching us that in the end of days, when Mashiach comes, Hashem is going to show the Goyim how everything they did in the world was really for the sake of the Jewish people. They're going to realize the benefit that they brought to Am Yisrael. That's when they're going to tell Hashem, Hashem, we actually did all this to benefit Am Yisrael, no? 
What, by the way, what's neshama? What's a classic example of how goyim they do things for our benefit and they don't even realize? Uh, when the Jews came down to Egypt, they were cast into what's called the kor habarzel. That's the iron crucible. A coal is a very, very hot oven with intense fire that's used to melt and purify all kinds of metals. Iron is one of them. Barzel contains impurities. So you take the iron and you put it into the coal, into this hot oven, and then all the impurities of the iron is released. That's how, by the way, they purify all kinds of metals, gold and silver. So the Torah refers to Egypt as the kor habarzel. And who's the barzel in this case? We are. Hashem put us in there in order to purify us. That means that the Egyptians didn't realize what they were really doing when they enslaved us. They were really purifying us so that we'd be ready to accept the Torah at Har Sinai. They thought they were torturing us, enslaving us, uh, 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 bending us to their will. But in reality, they were just preparing us for Matan Torah. So on the way out of the Galut Neshama, we tell the Egyptians, Toda Salamak, thank you for all you did for us these 210 years. We appreciate it. You thought you, we were working for you. But it's you who were actually working for us this entire time. So you know who the real Avadim were? Who were the real servants? Pao and his people. Because they were working for Hashem this entire time. So asks the Ariya Kadosh, why did they call Egypt the Kuha Barzel? The iron crucible. Iron wasn't the only thing they put in an oven. They could also put gold and silver. So why does it refer to as Kuha Barzel? And the Ari explains it's because we're the children of the Imahot. We're the children of the holy foremothers of Am Yisrael who brought the tribes of Israel to fruition. Who were those women? Barzel. Bilha, Rachel, Zilpa, and Leah. That means that Parah took the tribes who came from the Barzel, from these four women, mm -hmm. and placed them into the cool, into the hot oven, so to speak, in order to help them purify themselves and spiritually elevate. So even though we're reading the story of Egypt and we're, oh, Paro is hurting us, and Hashem says, no, it seems that they're breaking you, but they're actually bringing you to your destiny. So, in conclusion, that's why at the end of Bil'am's prophecy, he stands up and he speaks about Mashiach. And the Rambam writes that it's from Bil'am's prophecy that we bichal know that darach kochav mi Yaakov, that there is going to be a star that emanates from Yaakov, v'kam shevet be Yisrael, that there's going to be a tribe of Israel called Yehuda that will redeem the people. Why is Bil'am mentioning Mashiach? Because finally, 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 Bil'am saw that no matter what he and his grandfather and all the Gilgulim were trying to do to Am Yisrael, everything they did was ultimately for our best. And that their devious schemes were always foiled. And when Mashiach comes, it's all going to be very clear, clarified and revealed to the Goyim. Even the things we didn't understand and all the events that, that are transpiring in the world, the goyim are going to receive proof because it's going to be shown to them how everything they did was for our ultimate benefit. And at that moment, they're all going to realize how there really is no other force or independent power in the world other than Hashem. That's what the Navi Zachariah states. Salam shalom. Listen to his words. Ve'haya Hashem lemelech al kol ha'aretz. There's going to become a time where Hashem will be the supreme king of the entire world. What's the end of that pasuk, Sarah? Bayom hahu, on that day, ye Hashem echad, ushmo echad. God's name is going to be one. He'll be one and his name will be one. That means even the goyim will finally realize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is indeed echad. 
in the future when the goyim will see how everything they did <coughs> when they thought they were working independently of God and working against His will was really in assistance to Hashem and how they were actually fulfilling His will and how He was the one, the Echad was running the show and how He used them to bring the entire history of Am Yisrael to the final destiny of redemption in Mashiach that's when they're going to realize how there's no one in this world who has any power other than Hashem. That's when they're going to realize how they fit into Hashem's divine master plan of the Geula and the coming of the Mashiach. And that's when they're going to want to be rewarded. But Hashem's going to say, no can do. No can do. You're not going to be rewarded because it wasn't your intention to benefit anybody but yourselves. You don't have pure intentions. If you want to build the bridges and the roads with the intent of creating some spiritual end, an end that serves a spiritual and godly purpose, of course I would reward you. But everything you just did was for your own personal benefit and nothing more than that. But I'm showing you how despite your true intent, whether you knew it or not, you ended up helping the Jewish people. That's why Bil'am mentioned the coming of Mashiach. Because at that moment, when the oneness of Hashem and His supreme power is going to be revealed, we're going to understand how there's no other one, no other force, no power in the world, and how everything that seemed a certain way that we couldn't understand was for our benefit. Mm -hmm. That we all recognize the oneness of Hashem and His supreme power in the universe. May our intentions be channeled only to His will and His desires. And may those intentions be aimed towards a purpose that is truly meaningful, spiritually elevating, and for the sake of the Geula and the coming of Mashiach, Bekarov Mamash, Amen Ken, Yehi Ratzon.